If you're struggling in your career, business, or life, Welcome this to podcast Whispers and Bricks. is My for name you. Is Ari Shum, 9-11 I'm your survivor host. Ari Schoenbrunn shares inspiring mine, interviews uh, so you too can rise like a phoenix from the ashes person. to is, live your uh, best Melissa life. Jane Crump, Here's your host, better known Ari. As MJ to her friends. Uh, she's a very, very special woman. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you her bio right now, which is really, really amazing. Uh, and then I'm going to bring her in. Uh, MJ received a BA in international relations from George Washington University. She received an MS in global affairs from NYU and an MS in global affairs from Rutgers University. She then completed her PhD at Rutgers University Division of Global Affairs. MJ has lectured on American foreign policy and national security at Rutgers, Syracuse, and NYU. In 2012, she was awarded first place in the Richard A. Clark National Security and Counterterrorism Scholarship Contest. And in 2014, the Rutgers University Walter F. Weicker Scholarship celebrating students who possess academic excellence and a commitment to exceptional contributions to society. As a millennial activist, she has delivered remarks at conferences and gatherings around the world, including at the United Nations, the White House, and on Capitol Hill, and on behalf of the United States Air Force and the Republican National Committee. In 2017, Melissa was a candidate for the New York City Council in District 4 and remains actively invested in local and national political campaigns, community initiatives, and socially conscious startup businesses across a spectrum of impact-related causes around the world. MJ has served in a leadership position on the boards of over 40 nonprofits. For her philanthropic efforts, she was named one of the 36 under 36 by the Jewish Week and was nominated for a Jewish People's Choice Awards in the category of Making a Difference. In 2012, Melissa launched Passion for a Purpose, a full-service social impact and philanthropic developmental agent, development agency with offices in New York and Israel. She is also the co-founder of the Yishuv, the Fallen Faces Project, and Curio Auctions. She currently serves as a special advisor to Efrat Development Foundation and, uh, and the office of the mayor of Efrat in Gush Etzion, Israel. Please help me welcome Dr. Melissa Jane, MJ Kronfeld. MJ, how are you? I'm okay. How are you doing? Lovely to see you. Oh, man, it's so great seeing you. I'm so happy you, you agreed to come on the show. Um. I got to tell you something. You've certainly done a lot in, in your lifetime. I mean, I, I got tired just reading everything about you and all things that you've done and accomplished. It's, it's amazing. Truly. I that, but I'm pushing 40. So I would hope I would get some of these things done by now. So, yeah. oh, I, you know what? People don't get half this stuff done in their lifetimes. I mean, you delivered. I, I feel like it's still it's still not enough, but I guess that's the curse of those that that care about the world. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Look, you delivered remarks at conferences and gatherings around the world, including the, the UN, the White House, Capitol Hill. I mean, the United States Air Force. I mean, that must have been incredibly exciting, no? The Air Force, the Air Force is particularly special to me. Um, the Air Force graduation, the ROTC Air Force graduation at Rutgers University. Um, uh, was uh, was one of the, I still have the speech, it's, it's actually on YouTube, you can find it. Um, it was a speech that I labored over for weeks and weeks and weeks because a student of mine, I was a professor at Rutgers and a student of mine who, who I, I adored, it was, you know, she was, a bit, she was a bit problematic, but I adored her. She was an ROTC um, and she came to me one day and I, I honestly thought she didn't like me that much. I got this sense, she's a little standoffish with me, she never raised her hand, couldn't really engage her in the classroom. And she came up to me one day after class and she said, listen, I'm graduating this year and no woman has ever done the ROTC graduation speech. So I told the people at the ROTC that we got to get you to do it. First of all, I was thinking, well, why me? You know, like you plenty of amazing women who would be honored to do this. But the fact that a student who I was unsure liked me uh, had thought of me so highly um, was 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 one of the most uh, probably the most emotional and stirring moments of my life. I'll never forget. Like I thought my my heart was gonna drop out of my chest. I tried to play it cool, like uh, like a first day, like oh yeah, sure, I can, I would love to do that. Yeah, why not? Um, and I remember it kept me up for. We, I couldn't sleep. What do you say to young people who just spent, you know, four years doing ROTC, 
college and are now about to sign a contract with the United States government saying, I will die for my country if you tell me I have to, or if you send me somewhere where it may happen. I will give up my family. I will sacrifice my, 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 my personhood, everything to be in con- to conformity with this, with this very rigid structure that is the, the military. And, and, and I thought, what knowledge, and at the time I was 29, 30, at what knowledge could I impart upon these young people who have already achieved in four years doing ROTC more than I ever could in my life and who will achieve more in my in their lives than I ever could by serving in the uh, armed forces. And, and that speech was, uh, I think that was probably one of the ultimate highlights, highlights of my life. Wow. Wow. I also fell in, and, and there was a little divot in the stage in the middle of the speech. My heel fell down into the divot. So that was awesome. The whole thing is on camera. It's fantastic. I mean, I saved it. I happened to have been in the middle of a sentence and I kind of tied it in like, whoop, I wasn't expecting that to happen. Everyone laughed. But yeah, I was so nervous. But that was definitely the highlight of my life. The ROTC. Wow. Well, as you know, the name of the podcast is Whispers and Bricks. Now, the whispers are those voices telling us what the right thing to do is and represents the good in life. The bricks represent the bad things that that we go through. And we all know life is not a straight line. There are many ups and downs, many bumps in the road. What my listeners would like to know is, like, what were some of your struggles and or failures, if any? Some of the bricks that you got hit with when you were starting out in your career and throughout your career or your personal life, if you don't mind sharing. Absolutely. I don't mind sharing at all. I, I have the unique opportunity to get to speak to young people all around the world about my successes and failures. And I like to focus on the failures because I know when people either read my bio or they see me deliver a speech or they hear me on the radio or a television or a podcast like your own, they often think, well, wow, she really got her stuff together. And and I often tell young people, ah, you know, um, not so much. I think we all struggle with the same things. I would, I would be honest and say, and probably very relatable to many people in your audience. The biggest roadblock I had in my life was the passing of my father. Um, You know, this is not an uncommon thing. Parents die. Um, It happens, unfortunately, to everyone. But um, for me personally, my father um, and I were extraordinarily close, closer to him probably than anyone else in my family. Um, I sat by his bedside for the 14 days he was in the hospital uh, before he passed away. And um, I think what made that whole situation even more kind of overwhelming, but maybe also in retrospect, um, something I was able to overcome was that my father didn't tell me how sick he was. He told me he had cancer. He didn't tell me he had stage four cancer. He didn't tell me he had stage four bone cancer or stage four brain cancer. He just said, I got cancer and I'm getting treatment. And I, you know, I, at the time when he told me I was probably 27, 26, 27. And then I thought, all right, well, you know, cancer today, it's, it's nothing. We all, we, everyone beats cancer. You know, you gotta be really sick to die from cancer. You gotta be really far along to die from cancer. Of course, there's those terrible stories where someone finds out you only have four months to live, but my father um, just, you know, I, in, for better or worse, just was not honest with me and did not tell me. And he didn't tell me because he knew exactly what I would have done. I would have stopped everything that I was doing and I would have sought my life to take care of him. And I don't think he wanted that. So in retrospect, I understand. I don't even need to forgive him. Some things I need to forgive for, but I understand what he did. But my father passed away right when I was about to, I was dead smack in the middle of my PhD. And so I'm writing my dissertation, I'm teaching, and then my father dies. And um, to to get back on track from that, um, and I think anyone who's had a parent die understands, especially if you're close to them, it was, you know, it was a lot. But I, I will say I'm grateful for the, the 14 days that I sat by his hospital bed. We watched TV. I helped him go to the bathroom. I helped him change his diapers. I fed him, whatever he needed. And those 14 days... Uh, despite the fact that I traveled the world with my father, I had gone on adventures. We had done everything together. I mean, the man showed me the whole world. These 14 days to me are the most consequential, meaningful and important days. And he was just lying there and I was just holding his hand and we were watching. Um, it was either the Casey Anthony trial or one of the, one of those other terrible trials we watched the whole time. It was great. But that, that, that stopped me for quite some time. That, that stopped me for years. That was an obstacle that, I still think I'm overcoming, but uh, yeah, for years and years and years, I was unable to to really 
be the person that I was before. And I know now that I will never be that person again. And everything that has come from that adversity um, is definitive of who I am now. And my father's passing is just part and parcel of, of, of the, the strength that I have to find in the world on my own. That's, that's amazing. Um, I'm going to tell you my father, my father passed away uh, five years ago and my parents lived in Israel. The, the, my, my mom still lives in Israel and it had been a while since, since I had seen my dad and you know, there was just, I don't remember why or what, but you know, my dad had been sick. He'd been in and out of the hospital. Um, uh, he'd had a stroke and there, he was, he wasn't doing very well. And I said, uh, I told my wife, I says, you know, I want to go see my father before he dies. Okay. I really need to go and I, and I need to see him. And I went, um, I went in November at the time. I forgot, you know, again, five years ago, I went in November and I spent a week with him. And he was he was in a wheelchair because he, he really couldn't walk. And that, in the apartment, he was able to walk. But once we went outside, he was in a wheelchair. And I used to take him to the park. And we used we used to stop off at a little cafe and we had coffee together. And it was it was so, so special. And then in February, um, he was he was readmitted to the hospital. And I remember calling my brother who lived in Israel. And I said, you know, what's, what's going on? You know, do I, do I need to come? And my brother said, no, they just changed dad's medication. He seems to be responding. He seems to be getting better. It's, you know, and, and I realized after afterwards in, in hindsight, you know, I, I know uh, just from, from experience that, you know, right before somebody dies, they usually get a little bit better. Yes. You yes. know, they get, they get a little bit better. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and I'm not sure why, but they do. And that's what happened. I should have known back then that, you know, I need to get on a plane and go, but I didn't. And uh, I received the news on Saturday night that he had passed away. So, you know, obviously I got on a plane and, and I went and I was there for the funeral. Thank God I was able to get there. But those that week will stand out in my mind more than anything else. My dad was a great dad. He really was. He was, he was super um, and, but that was the thing that's, that stands out in my mind. So I thank God that I actually took the time to spend with him kind of like what you did, which is really, it's, it, it's special. It's very special because now I'm going to tell you something else, um, that, cause you mentioned that, you know, you're not the same person when you go through something, a life-changing experience. All right. You're never, ever going to be the same person. I am not the same person today that I was pre nine 11. 9-11 totally changed my life. And I think, you know, obviously I, I personally believe if it's for the better. So, um, and, and I dealt with it and it took time, all right, to deal with, with all the trauma and everything else. But let me ask you this, okay? So you've been through a lot, you know, you've had a lot of bricks thrown at you, but did you ever get to a point so low where you, you said, you know what, I quit. I, yes. I can't do this anymore. I'm giving up on my dreams, you know, I, I just, but like, how did you deal with that? And how did you make your comeback? Yeah, that's so, um, that's a really fantastic question. So I've, I've had a couple of them and they were kind of back to back. Um, you know, I, um, I obviously, as you read from my bio, I pursued a very, uh, very steady academic career, bachelor's, two masters and a PhD. So I was full-time um, school, but I was full-time work as well. And I always wanted to be a journalist. And, and I, you know, I got to a point where journalism became just very difficult, especially because I was working for a, the New York Post um, and other dailies, and it became very stressful. And I quit journalism, not, not, I say I'm a journalist today, but I quit like the kind of daily grind, the kind of daily journalism, tabloid journalism that I wanted to do, the kind of crime beat stuff, um, because I got so low and I reinvented myself as a professor. And then when my father died in the middle of me being fast tracked on a tenure track because the school was very impressed with, with my teaching, I, um, you know, my father died and I quit teaching. Um, and then I got into, I've always been involved in politics, but I've been in politics so long that the Republicans um, asked me to run for office. And when I lost that, and anyone who's been in politics understands that, of course, someone wins and someone loses. But when you're on the losing side, it's a lot harder <laughs> than it looks. Um, and I quit politics. Um, 
And those three times I was so low and I'd reinvented myself and then it didn't work again. I reinvented myself and then it didn't work a third time and I reinvented myself. And I, I, the, by the time the end of the pilot, by the time I lost my campaign for city council, I had gone to the point where I, I just felt like the most worthless like human being in the world. I just felt like I couldn't do anything right. I gave up my career in journalism because I wasn't good enough. And I gave up my career in teaching because I couldn't cope with my dad's death. And then I gave up politics because I lost. But what happened was I built my company, Passion for a Purpose, which is a social impact consultancy. And I was able to take from each of those experiences to build what I have today. So, you know, I took from uh, my experience in journalism, the storytelling, the, the, the kind of sharing, um, you know, unique um, uh, insights into the world. And, you know, my company became very, very popular with nonprofits that wanted to rebrand or share their stories. I took my entire space in politics and understanding how all of the, you know, the intricacies of politics works, to be able to work with the right kinds of leaders and politicians to elevate their message and elevate their impact. Um, I took the death of my father um, to really, you know, return to Torah and understand that, like, we are supposed to live when a parent passes in honor of them and do a great mitzvot votes and sit for them all the time. My company focuses on exclusively social impact work. And my career in professorship, I, you know, I taught my students every single day. I can stand here in the classroom and teach you all kinds of things, but if you don't go out there and do these things, what I'm teaching you means nothing. And the greatest part was my company started because six of my students came with me to work for free for the first five years to get me off the ground. So the politics, the journalism, the death of my father and the professorship were the, and the, were the, five, the four things that came together that actually created me to be the CEO, boss, president, founder of my company. Um, and my company thrived and has been successful in ways that I never imagined, specifically because I never thought, one, I would ever have a business. I always thought I'd be a professor or a journalist. Um, but two, it provided me the opportunity to create a niche market that nobody else could actually do. Nobody can do what we do at my company. You could put together, you know, I'm sure McKinsey Global can do it if you want to pay them a million dollars, or BCG can do it if you want to pay them $500,000. But what we created through these experiences was I was able to bring all of these different contacts and experiences and people together who then trusted me because I was the professor, trusted me because I was their candidate, trusted me um, because I had um, uh, been a journalist and I'd always been honest and everyone wanted to then be a part of what I was creating now. And only that would have happened only had I, you know, because I failed at those four, I won't mean failure is a big word, but because I had left or, you know, or not succeeded in the way that I'd wanted to in these other endeavors. Wow. You know, they always say uh, a, a failure is just a stepping stone to success. But it doesn't. Know? Feel that way when failure happens. A hundred percent. I agree with you a hundred percent. You know, um, I remember when um, <clears throat> back in the uh, early nineties, when I was a foreign currency trader and then the market, uh, the, the market fell out of bed and places closed and the shop that I was at closed down. And, you know, I was next thing, you know, I was, I was on top of the world and now I'm, you know, now I'm unemployed and I'm not making any money. And, you know, it was really, it was, it was crazy, but it was a stepping stone. It led me to Canton Fitzgerald, which is where I worked for the next 23 plus years, you know? So it was, you know, we don't often see, you know, why the things happen when they happen, all right. But we have to have the belief that God is looking out for us and he knows what's best for us. And although it may look like it's really bad at the end of the day, it turns out really good. You know, yeah, and I'm uh, oh, sorry. No, 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 please go ahead. This is I about you, not me. No, no. Just the, you nailed it on the head because my return to Torah taught me that that's that's the biggest thing that, that I think I'd grown in over the past year or so, especially being in Israel and being so embedded in my faith, is that like when things go really, really, really wrong, I may still cry, I may still scream, I may shout at my assistant, I may shout at the workman or the handyman, I may throw a plate and yes, I'm a plate thrower, I may tell my dogs to go sleep somewhere else, I don't want to cuddle them, you know, I may, whatever it is, I may have an extra beer, you know, whatever, whatever it is, I've also at some point upon everything, something going wrong, small or big, stopped and said to myself, 
I'm not going to see it now. I may not see it tomorrow. I may not see it in 10 years from now. But there's a reason this is happening. This is what Hashem wants. And this is going to be part and parcel of something else. And if it's not, then it's simply something that he's put in front of me to make me stronger. Because as the cliche goes, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But right, in right. the past year, the past, I should really say the past three years and making Aliyah and the challenge <laughs> that that was. And for your audience, making Aliyah means, you know, when you're Jewish, you return to Israel. Uh, all Jews have a right to immigration to Israel. And um, the making Aliyah process is literally returning to Israel. Um, when my Aliyah was such a challenge. It was so difficult. I came here with no friends and no family and no support from home. And I say that with all due respect to my family, my brothers, my sisters, my mother, but they were not supportive of this decision and they remain unsupportive of this decision today. Um, and so it wasn't like I could call home and be like, oh my God, I had the worst day ever. I don't speak Hebrew. So I couldn't get the handyman to come and the washing machine broke. And, and then the cat, a cat, a street cat ran to the house and the dog ran across the street and the beach is tsunami and there's a terrorist attack and a war and a rocket. And, you know, and all I get from home is, well, you wanted to move to Israel. So the challenges before me, you know, really have made me stop and consider that no matter how bad it is, no matter how loud I cry or scream, at some point I've stopped and say to myself, nope, this is going to be for something, for somewhere, somehow, some why. Right. I also know, because um, I have inside information, that you've got support from an organization called Strength to Strength because mm -hmm. you sit on their board and we both yeah. sit on their board That's and we both true. know Sari Singer. Right. And she is a pillar of strength. All yes. right. For for everybody in that organization, as well as me and you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I know that you, you are very well loved. OK. And you do have a great support. They have a support team behind okay. you. Look, I support you. OK. Um, and you know that you can pick up a phone anytime and call me no matter what day or night. You know that I, I, I am there for you. Um, it is amazing. What, what you've done is absolutely amazing. Now, let me just ask you this. Um, two things. One, so if people want to want to find out more about uh, 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 what, what was it called? A pain? Passion for a purpose. Pas passion for a purpose. Okay. Um, no pain for a purpose. There's no, no purpose passion, passion, passion. For, passion for a purpose. Okay. Um, where do people find out about it? How do they get in touch with you? Um, sure. It's super easy. It's P-F-A-P, -P, Passion for a Purpose, P-F-A-P-N-Y-C.com. Um, and if you Google Passion for a Purpose, we've been around for a decade. So you, our Instagram, our Twitter, and our YouTube will pop right up. Um, we'll definitely be on the very top of your Google feed. But everything is linked to P-F-A-P-N-Y-C.com. You can get in touch with me personally uh, via email. You can watch that. ROTC video. If you go to our YouTube page, it's 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 there. It's still up there. I was fortunate one of my students came with me and recorded it. Um, but I am and I am available all the time. I, I I say to my 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 staff all the time. We actually, you know there are work days and then there are talk days. I spend all you know three or four days a week, all day talking to people. Uh, whether they need a mentor, they need an idea, they don't know what they're doing. I literally dedicate you know at least at least each week, three days, just fielding phone calls of people. Something that may have nothing to do with business. It may lead to no potential opportunities. It may just need somebody who saw me online or saw a video and they were just like, hey, I have an idea or I've been thinking about this or I don't know which way to go. I, I all day long, I would talk to people. I believe that there's nothing better than giving what I can back. So which is why when you asked me, I immediately jumped at the opportunity. I mean, and I, and I say this without, without Jess, I literally, in one of these days that we schedule for these kind of crazy calls where I'm just talking to random people all day long who reached out to us, I literally had a phone call with a guy who said to me, I want to make pickles. I want to use my Bubby's recipe and I want to make a pickle company. And, and like, this is my passion. My passion is pickling and I love pickles. And, you know, I just want to know how to get started. And I was like, well, you know, have you thought about, you know, farming maybe? Cause he lived out, he lived out um, in upstate New York. And, um, and he's like, no, I never thought about it. I was just really thinking about buying the cucumbers and doing the brine. And I was like, no, let's, let's think bigger than this. Let's think about how we can create kind of like a sustainable farm operation, a cucumber farm. And we'll bring people out. You have pickling classes. It could be really cool. I mean, you're already out there anyway. You've got lots of land. My phone call, two phone calls later, was a guy who was looking to sell his farm in the Anirondacks. So had a completely sustainable, eco-friendly, your vegetable farm and his primary produce cucumbers no so, way it happened it happened six years ago it happened it really happened and i was like you've got to be kidding me i just got off the phone but the guy wants to pickle 
And, <laughs> and wow. that, that experience though taught me that these three days are the most important work days of my week. And even I have had phone calls. I had a phone call. I literally just yesterday had a phone call six months ago that something happened on a phone call today that I thought, oh, wow, that's great. I connected those two people right now, right this very moment, they're meeting because of the, the, the potential opportunity there to connect. So I take these three days very seriously. And anyone who ever wants to talk to me um, can. I think that really comes from my time being a professional professor. I loved being in the classroom, not because I could talk forever and I like being heard, but I love just kind of looking out and seeing young minds absorbing things or seeing people think about new ideas or being there to hear theirs and kind of hash it out. Um, and I have my perspectives, you noted, I'm a Republican, a proud Republican, um, you know, and in that classroom, it was, it was very clear to my students who were very used to, you know, non-Republican professors. Right. And so, I mean, but I love, I love just hearing what people are working on, hearing how I can help and, and seeing what I can do to connect them with others, it, not even being related to my work. It's just my passion. Wow. That, you know, right I, now. I, I'm, I'm speechless. I, I'm really speechless. And oh, it takes yeah. a lot. It takes a lot for me to be speechless. Let me tell you. But I, as, as, the, as George Costanza said on Seinfeld, I'm speech. I without speech. <laughs> all right before we go i just yeah. want to know is there anything that you'd like to share with my audience any words of wisdom or any words of advice wow hard stop okay i thought i, I thought maybe you could see the question i was thinking about it so um okay so i think the most important lesson that i've learned um, in my 38 plus years, by 38, I mean, I'm almost 39, um, years on this mortal coil is, is, is fearlessness. Um, to me, that is my, the most important lesson, just, just fearlessness. Um, whether it's, it's, it's a, something in school or something at work, I, I tell everyone I meet and all the young people I mentor to be fearless, you know, to, to put yourself out there in a way, not just like take a major risk, but be fearless when you know it's the right thing. Don't hesitate when you when your heart is invested and your mind is invested and you think you can you you think you can do it, but you're too scared to. No, go do it. Be fearless. I spend the vast majority of my time working with small businesses. And the thing that I learned from all of these people is that they're always like, I met this great designer. She's like, but my bags will never sell. I meet this great farmer, but no one will like my meat. I meet this, uh, you know, the other day I met with a guy who wants to, to build, um, you know, build a new settlement, but who will come? No, don't worry about that right now. If you believe so strongly in your heart that you're willing to sacrifice everything to make that bag, to build that settlement, to raise that cow, then what will happen after that? They will come. Like if you build it, they will come. So be fearless in your building. And I promise they will come. I see it happen all the time. It may take a week, it may take a minute, month, a year, but if you are so fearless in how you build what you believe in, then I, I know in my heart that it will come. It may not be the way you want it to, but it does happen. I had too many stories. I've seen it too many times to know that that's not real. Fearlessness is the most important thing you can have in life because my goodness, it goes by so quickly. And, and, and the next thing you know, you're, you're a little too old to be so fearless. So be fearless. That, that is, that is awesome. That is just like, um, those, but when you say be fearless, you know, and you're chasing a dream, mm -hmm. those are the whispers that God is giving you. Those are the yeah. things that he's whispering to your heart and to your mind, you know, the, telling you, all right, this is what you need to do. All right. Those are the whispers and uh, listen to the whispers. All right. Because you know what? You want to try and avoid the bricks. Now it's inevitable. You're going to get hit with a brick. There's no doubt about it. Okay. But if, as long as you keep listening to those whispers, all right. It's not going to be so bad when the bricks come. All right. So that is, that is just amazing. Uh, uh, it's really words of inspiration, literally words of inspiration. I can go on and on, but uh, I don't like to go so long on the show. So MJ, I want to thank you so much for sharing your story with my audience. Good luck going forward. You've been listening to whispers and bricks and I'm your host, Ari Sherman until next time. Listen to the whispers, avoid the bricks, and never, ever give up on your dreams. Bye for now.